Iron Man 2, you stand accused of being the MCU's first misfire, disappointing Robert Downey Jr. with your performance, juggling way too many plots, having subpar villains, and being one of the worst sequels in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. How do you plead? I am wondering if and when any actual expert will also be in attendance. Oh yeah, that's me. Definitely not guilty. Full disclosure, 10 years ago, I hated Iron Man 2 the first time I saw it in theaters. I can't tell you why, I just did. I didn't watch it again until two years later when I wanted to prep for the Avengers. That time, it was okay. By the third time I watched it, I didn't remember why I hated it at all. Maybe I was in a bad mood when I watched it. Maybe the popcorn butter made me gassy. I don't know, but it turned out that Iron Man 2 was a solid sequel that literally set the MCU in motion more than any other movie before it had at that point. And like all good sequels are supposed to do, it built upon every positive thing Iron Man had going for it. Look, it's no secret that Tony and Pepper have the best relationship within the MCU. Scott and Hope, you guys come in a close second, though it can get a little abusive at times. You wanna show me how to punch? Show me. That's how you punch. Obviously we saw flashes of this in the first Iron Man, but it's not until Iron Man 2 when we really get to see the chemistry between the two when they're in full on relationship mode. You're not listening to me, no, I'm trying to make you see me. Why won't you let me? For whatever reason, the villains seem to get a lot of flack in Iron Man 2, and I've got no clue why. They're as solid as Mickey Rourke's Russian accent. Not since the Penguin and Catwoman in Batman Returns or the Joker Two-Face One-Two Punch in the Dark Knight have we seen a film successfully juggle two villains in one film. Having multiple villains in a sequel can oftentimes result in the kiss of death, but here they complement each other in a logical way. I shouldn't even have to defend Sam Rockwell, he's brilliant in everything he does and he's fantastic as Justin Hammer, the antithesis for Tony Stark. Mickey Rourke as Ivan Vonko, I would argue, is still one of the unsung villains in the MCU, which leads me to my next point. Jeff Bridges as Obadiah Stane was a great villain, but his Ironmonger armor always felt a little underwhelming to me in the first Iron Man. It feels technologically inferior to the Iron Man suit, and as a result, the climax doesn't really age well. The Monaco racetrack fight, though, it's freaking badass. Go watch it again and try to tell me this isn't one of the best fight scenes in the entire MCU. Notice the fear quivering in Tony's eyes as he realizes he's in deep once Tony dons the Mark V armor, still one of the coolest Iron Man suit ups to this day by the way, and you can see Tony get his mojo back. Also, did no one else catch that Tony gets whiplash while racing a car? Outstanding. Everyone knows Terrence Howard was originally Rhodey, but for whatever reason, <laughs> money, it didn't work out and he was replaced by Don Cheadle. I'm never a fan of recasting characters, but it happens from time to time. However, Iron Man 2 handled the swap superbly. Watch as Don Cheadle walks into the courtroom, his back to the camera. At this point, Terrence Howard not coming back was news. <laughs> Remember when I said I don't like when actors get recast? I'm never a fan of recasting characters. Recasting characters. This literally felt like Don Cheadle telling me to go f myself. And you know what? I liked it. I just, I drop it. All right. What a perfect way to handle it. Chef's kiss. Both Iron Man and the Incredible Hulk hinted at the greater MCU. However, a lot of the Hulk foreshadowing never paid off, and Iron Man only had the end credit scene with Nick Fury. As I mentioned earlier, Iron Man 2 was really the first film that dropped a lot of hints about the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Black Widow is obviously the big one, and her fight scene in the hallway is still a crazy awesome sequence, by the way. But it also builds on Agent Coulson and Nick Fury and introduces John Slattery as Howard Stark in archive footage, Gary Shanling as Senator Stern, who we'd find out later is a filthy Hydra agent. It's pretty obvious that director John Favre wanted to adapt Demon in a Bottle, which if you don't know is the most famous storyline from the Iron Man comics. Demon in a Bottle is about Tony Stark struggling with alcoholism, which was a groundbreaking storyline for comic books at the time it was released. But since Iron Man 2 was the first Marvel film under the Disney umbrella, it makes sense that they didn't want to feature their new marquee superhero as an alcoholic. A storyline made more complicated by Robert Downey Jr.'s own troubled past, which was still a concern at this time. 
Palladium poisoning or palladium poisoning doesn't matter, it seems would be the solution. The thing that's slowly poisoning Tony is also the thing he's completely dependent on. Tony getting drunk at his birthday party is even more of a tip to the hat to that storyline without making it the focus of the film. It's a rather smart way to tackle the issue and Iron Man 2 doesn't get enough credit for that. So what's my point? Point is, uh, you're welcome, I guess. Iron Man 2 is an excellent sequel and has held up much better than earlier MCU films. If you don't believe me, give it another watch and report back later. You can find me on Twitter at Chris Killian or Instagram at CK Comedy. Bring it on and thanks for watching.